I am also the founding chair and scientific director of the McGill uh, Center for the Convergence of Health and Economics. And uh, at the center, we have three lines of work, each attached to um, a distinct uh, webinar series. And today, I am very pleased to welcome you to the Convergence Innovation webinar series, uh, which is essentially um, a series where uh, we bring the best of science as well as visionary uh, practitioner um, with the objective of innovating the way we innovate by bringing the power of AI, you know, the digital technology, as well as a deep understanding of uh, human uh, systems and uh, business and society. Uh, the series is sponsored by uh, the first uh, Convergence Innovation Platform created in 2016 uh, in the agri-food space, the, the Global Pulse Innovation Platform Partner. And uh, today I am very pleased to welcome uh, Elias uh, Kahayanis uh, that I will introduce uh, <coughs> uh, now. Uh, Elias is a full professor in, of science, technology, and innovation, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, at George Washington University. Uh, he is also the co-founder and co-director of the Global and Entrepreneurial Finance Research Institute uh, um, and director of the Research in Science, Technology, and Innovation also at the EU Research Center. Uh, Elias is clearly one of the pioneers uh, in advancing the science of innovation to progressively develop models that not only started bridging uh, industry, um, science, technology, uh, and, uh, and uh, innovation in the first uh, layer of the triple helix, but progressively adding the much needed complexity of adding the social aspects, adding the environmental, and all of this are clearly powered by uh, digital technology uh, and artificial intelligence. So we start today from Industry 4.0 to Industry 5.0, which is a bit uh, um, scary when many people are still struggling to go from industry 1.0 to 4.0, but that makes the talk quite fascinating. He will be talking about uh, this transition in the context of the Kentipole uh, Innovation uh, Elix framework, uh, which is of most interest uh, for all of us uh, uh, regular uh, an occasional participant to this uh, series. So without further, uh, in, oh, before I shift to Elias, a bit of uh, uh, process. We work normally uh, with uh, uh, 40, 45 minutes presentation, and uh, then we keep half an hour for uh, discussion or question. Uh, I think uh, Sabina will be muting all of you. Uh, during the presentation, and then uh, we'll be unmuting all of us for the discussion. Uh, you can also ask questions in the chat box that um, Sabina will be uh, asking. Uh, so, Elias, welcome, and I'm shifting to you. All right. Uh, I'm very pleased and uh, happy to have this opportunity to talk to our audience today about some subjects that are very uh, near and dear to me and uh, I think of interest to all. Uh, Professor Dubé indeed uh, was introduced to me by a common uh, friend, a colleague of ours uh, recently, and I appreciate the opportunity to engage with all of you. The um, subject is uh, of the presentation today is indeed looking at the evolution uh, of, of technology, but also uh, touches on issues that uh, impact society, uh, even democracy, and uh, of course, uh, the environment and how they all interact. The Industry 4.0 paradigm, of course, is well known 
if not yet fully understood and implemented. And uh, the purpose of my presentation's title is to challenge our thoughts and ideas and imagination. The industry 4.0 is more uh, of a machine-centric approach and architecture. The uh, 5.0 aims to uh, be more balanced between machine-centric and actually with a bias for human-centric configurations. So we can ensure that eventually technology will be serving uh, humans and not the other way around and will be part of the solution and not the problem, whether it's fake news, social media disruptions or other issues. And certainly as it pertains to um, the issues of, uh, that I'll discuss uh, in the following set slides that relate to what I call uh, natural versus artificial scarcity and abundance that uh, relates to food, security, and so forth. The quintuple innovation helix framework uh, is a concept uh, we have developed with my uh, network of research partners over the last 10 plus years. About 15 years ago, we introduced, we are the one of those who introduced uh, the quadruple innovation helix context uh, concept out of which the quintuple emerged. And of course, they're based and they, I think, substantially extend and expand the triple helix concept, which is focusing on government, university, and industry as the pillars of knowledge economies and societies. We thought that it is important to emphasize the role, the presence, role, and influence of civil society, which is the fourth dimension, and then uh, the fifth dimension is the environment. Um, so let me uh, briefly uh, reflect on the abstract that is the uh, frame of reference, conceptual frame of reference of our uh, discussion today. Uh, there are several issues that I'll try to touch on, I'm assuming uh, certain uh, familiarity and literacy uh, in a sense uh, regarding these concepts with people happy to discuss in more detail as best I can. Hopefully I'll add some value and I will not simply be repeating known things to everybody. Uh, first of all, it is concepts like, of course, Industry 3.0, but also the digital transformation and the Internet of Things, as well as different types of AI um, and design thinking that relate on how we uh, can best engage developing, designing, and implementing uh, ecosystems of innovation and entrepreneurship and involving government, university, industry, and civil society entities in a manner that is both effective and efficient. And of course, this uh, pivots substantially on technological artifacts, tools, and, and, and methodologies. Uh, so the issue of machine-centric versus human-centric approaches, the industry 4.0 versus 5.0 is relevant. In fact, I will even touch on the 6.0 paradigm, which is sort of a thinking beyond the horizon thing, but the thing is very relevant in our uh, contingencies and dynamics of today. So the idea of looking at the nature and dynamics of the transition, evolution and transition in transformation from 4.0 to 5.0 uh, are discussed in this context. We are operating uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a world where there is network ubiquity, and this is something that has emerged over the last two decades, actually, with the commercialization of the internet and um, the uh, development of technology, the broad adoption and diffusion of technological, uh, again, artifacts and standards, and in the end, whether it's smartphones or the internet of things, uh, the connectivity of everything and everyone. The, the open standards approach is, uh, is meant to be a, a, a an approach that will enable and facilitate more effective and efficient, as I said earlier, configurations. Of course, there's always the war of the standards going on in the background, whether it concerns, at this point, uh, companies or countries. And then there is the new business design issue and business model innovation, including social business model innovation, is very pertinent to this uh, in this regard. And so in that sense, uh, we can think of and we're looking into horizontal, vertical, and diagonal, if you wish, configurations and, and transformations. Um, in a brief overview, and this is a slide, by the way, that was first I first developed for a presentation at the European Commission almost 20 years ago now. Uh, this was shortly after 9-11. Uh, 
Um, and it still, I think, remains with some additions and amendments pertinent and relevant today. I talked about a world of natural and artificial scarcities at the time, issues of geoeconomic, geopolitical, and geotechnological multipolarity versus oligopolarity, world divides of all kinds, social, political, economic, cultural, knowledge, and digital. Failed and, develop, and failing developed and developing states and issues that, of course, have been a challenge, whether it is the European Union or other parts of the world, uh, as we hear the news today. And um, for that matter, China and India are not a homogeneous bloc, as we know well. They consist of multiple constituencies and stakeholders, and that is something that they had better remember and take into account. Um, challenges and opportunities versus uncertainties and risks. These are issues that have to do with people, culture, and technology. And this relates to the different standards, whether it's industry 4.0 or 5.0. The role of diasporas and migration, the issue of displaced people movements and the impact they have uh, locally and globally. And then, of course, within that context, dogma versus democracy and tolerance versus inclusion. In a more practical sense, the, the uh, standards and designs that I think will be more sustainable uh, financially, socially, and environmentally, and in that sense will emerge as winners, uh, are those that rely or very much are sensitive to issues of the four A's and three C's listed here, availability, awareness, accessibility, and affordability, and then how you implement that has to do with communication, cooptation, and coordination. You need to make sure you make a convincing case and you make it well. Within Europe in particular, which was the focus of the presentation to the European Commission at the time, and I left it in here because I think it's still pertinent for other parts of the world as well, including uh, the US, uh, there are, there are cro there's a crossroads, many different challenges as you can read the slide, challenges and opportunities, of course, in a global, local, or global sense. So you have global crossroads of peoples, cultures, and technologies in a, both a real and a virtual sense. We have convergence of standards and platforms that limits our degrees of freedom, but then also diversity of applications and needs that increases the complexity of interdependencies and the required versatility of solutions. And then the issue of scarcity of resources versus fuzziness of vision uh, is very pertinent. When I was writing this, it was several years before the uh, Eurozone crisis uh, emerged and blew up, in fact, and of course the, uh, the uh, major uh, recession that took place here uh, in the U.S. starting in 2008. The issue is, as I write here, la robe de largeur et de profondeur, the issue of through uh, solidarity versus playing uh, geopolitical games, using currencies and weapons, and then enablers and opportunities that relate to those, the ambient intelligence solutions, and this is now touching on the AI, artificial intelligence applications and configurations, as they may also apply to water, food, and energy issues. And of course, self-similarity, looking at things like chaos theory and managing and leveraging complexity uh, are, of course, at work here. The ecosystems we're looking at are very modular and in many ways self-similar. So the resource scarcity challenge, as you can see from this slide, is definitely uh, a, a matter to ponder and, and reflect upon. This is not something that uh, will go away or will actually even uh, become less of an issue, be more of an issue some interesting statistics related to agriculture. And of course, in addition to what we see here is the fact that traditional agriculture, meat-centric, I would call it agriculture, is a major uh, environmental polluter too, in addition to the energy consumption it entails, so, and water consumption. So that's, you know, that's a vicious cycle we need to address. Uh, in connection with this, many countries, including uh, China, for instance, uh, are trying to cope with the, the, the issues they see emerging in terms of uh, managing their own domestic scarcity issues and their own domestic uh, internal migration and or displacement issues. Um, they try to do so by, uh, among other things, expanding globally. And they do so in places like many African countries, as you can see here, 
in terms of the land acquired by Chinese companies going back 30 years now. And uh, also that applies to Australia as well, from what I know. They're the, the a major, if not the biggest, landowner in Australia as well nowadays. Um, so the conceptual framework or, or, or paradigm, if, if I may, I may say so about uh, what we're looking at is this idea of whether or how technology, as I said, could become more part of the solution than the problem. It is a double-edged sword, as we know well, and it is used both to enable, empower, uh, create abundance, but also to introduce artificial scarcity to maximize profits and power and control, whether it relates to water or, or other uh, foodstuffs that are satisfying basic human need and right, I would say. So this is this is an issue I borrowed the concept from Ilya Prigozhin's book, From Being to Becoming. Uh, so here is from, about from socioeconomic being to techno-economic becoming in the era of cyber prosperity. So the implied or implicit questions here and challenges are whether and how we could leverage artificial technology and other technological modalities to move from the bottom left natural scarcity regimes to the top right artificial abundance. Um, I'm old enough to be, uh, you know, I guess a Star Trekkie, and I will always remember, and it always inspires me, uh, the uh, replicator concept, producing uh, artifacts, including food on demand. Now, our 3D and 4D printing technologies and applications nowadays are getting very close to this, and drone and other technologies in terms of the delivery uh, uh, supply chain and infrastructure issues are also part of that enabling um, uh, modality, set of modalities. Uh, looking at innovation to understand how we can move through technology from uh, scarcity to abundance. It is about, you know, innovation is about enhancing the yield of resources via successful technology commercialization. So uh, technology transfer and commercialization, in fact, the context within which that whole idea was first developed and I was fortunate to be one of the, at the time, junior colleagues of Everett Rogers, one of the well-known seminal authors of technology transfer and commercialization. The technology transfer was conceived and first applied in the context of ag agriculture. Innovation, for that matter, is a socio-economic, socio-technical, socio-political phenomenon. That's important to remember. In, in terms of its breadth and depth of impact and implications. Innovation is uh, an uphill battle. In most cases, quote Machiavelli here, the innovator has the enemies, as for enemies, all who have done well under the old, and lukewarm def defenders and those who may do well under the new. So until and unless you start becoming uh, an apparent inevitability, you will always have people questioning you. So uh, intestinal fortitude is a must in that sense for entrepreneurial and innovation efforts. Uh, the open innovation paradigm uh, is shown here to highlight the potential and power of uh, driving innovation in an open manner. And we look at the innovation panel concept here through, from the research to development and commercialization and the different elements or components of what that implies. IP stands for intellectual property, by the way. And this is just uh, a schematic representing the different, uh, you know, the, the production of basic, of, of new knowledge, so basic research and development, all the way to its commercialization into uh, solutions, products, and services. Uh, we have worked on uh, modifying and evolving, I believe, uh, and enhancing the concept of open innovation as we did with the Triple Helix. Uh, we worked on and we're, we developed the concept of targeted open innovation and in the context of global, global, local, because I believe that this is really the true nature of open innovation. Openness is never uh, universally and um, uh, totally um, uh, open. It is more a matter of uh, targeted uh, approaches, whether it's about uh, technology and business strategy or national priorities. Um, going on to the quadruple helix innovation concept that I mentioned earlier, we see here how that comes into play in place. This is, by the way, a modality that has been widely adopted uh, in Europe and it is being uh, 
uh, leveraged as a conceptual guideline and enabler of uh, the design of actions, initiatives, programs, and, and the production or development of solutions. Uh, the idea, again, is that you involve government, uh, public sector, but also the academic and private sectors, along with civil society, in a rather uh, intertwined and engaged manner. You pursue top-down policies and uh, uh, guidelines or, or practices, formulation in interaction in tandem with bottom-up actions, initiatives, and uh, visions emerging from the civil society. And this is now looking at the quintuple helix, embedding civil, the, the quadruple helix, government, university, industry, and civil society in the context of the environment. So this is a triple top and triple bottom line uh, paradigm, uh, social, financial, and environmental sustainability priorities, along with ethical, transparent, and of course, effective and efficient designs is what enables what you see in the center here, which we, what we call smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Um, going on to uh, look at these concepts a little, in a little bit more detail, um, along with the quadruple and quintuple helix, we uh, have developed or, or conceptualized a, a way to operationalize those uh, through a paradigm that we call mode three. Mode three is extending again and extending the mode one and mode two paradigms uh, more linear and slightly um, um, interactive uh, models of knowledge production systems. Uh, Gibbon and Novotny and others have written about those. And uh, we developed the mode three to highlight the presence and the importance of higher order learning. So cognition and metacognition, and this is now again very pertinent and, and significant in the context of AI applications uh, and modalities as enablers. Uh, whether it's big data analytics, uh, Internet of Things, or, or other issues. How you learn, how you change your learning at higher levels are very central in what we're discussing here. So the mode three in the double helix context is what we're uh, really uh, using and adopting as our approach. You see the mode three uh, described in a little more detail here. And you notice at the bottom we talk about the democracy of knowledge paradigm and how we can maximize the diffusion and adoption of innovations in the context of communities of interest and practice, but also more broadly speaking, stakeholders in the civil society domain realm that actually are uh, informed, empowered, and engaged. Um, and this is really the uh, oxygen and the blood of uh, sustainable democracies nowadays. Um, this is also placed now in a more system-centric uh, manner. Uh, we're looking at macro, meso, and micro levels of how the mode three can be operationalized and the, in connection with the quadruple and quintuple innovation helix frameworks, and also how that actually extends and expands from the local to the global. We see concepts as in the top right of democratic capitalism, at the end of our discussion today, hopefully time allowing, uh, I will mention and I will welcome input with regards to the um, uh, one emerging uh, approach that actually relates to the forthcoming elections in the U.S., the, the Green New Deal issue. And of course, uh, people are talking about democratic socialism, but yet it may well be that as far as sustainability for the long run, we may need to figure out a way to sustain both freedom and, of course, fairness. So that may be related to what we relate or refer to as a democratic capitalist concept. The uh, EU, of course, over the years has been uh, institutionalizing uh, funding and support, and many other countries, including Canada, are doing the same for science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship. You see the framework. Uh, seven, uh, an earlier uh, configuration uh, just before the Horizons, the FP8 effectively is the Horizons program, but they all really focus on main thematic uh, focal areas and then underlying those are calls for proposals and so forth. Um, with funding at both the continental and the, and the national and regional levels. 
this is one way to go about actually implementing building what we're looking at, which is a 21st century, uh, excuse me, uh, get a hold of the slides here, um, 21st century innovation ecosystem, which we see or understand to be multi-level, multi-modal, multi-nodal, and multi-agent system of systems. And this is that, the idea is that here we have uh, uh, in networks of networks and clusters of clusters uh, of innovation and knowledge, respectively, that actually operate, exist, form, emerge, and uh, mutate, if you wish, in uh, under conditions of co collaboration and competition for resources that are, if not scarce, are never sufficient. So we have competition driving commercialization. Uh, eventually, you identify how you can best operate, you, you figure out your most sustainable, if you wish, smart growth solution, and then eventually uh, you co-evolve in the process and move on to the next level, <clears throat> under, always, always under conditions of competition. Um, the um, uh, perspective in more detail of this innovation and, and, and entrepreneurship ecosystem would involve things like the political system, economic system, natural environment, education system, and the media-based and culture-based public. And all of them are interacting and impacting each other, hopefully producing sustainable development conditions. This next slide shows uh, in some detail uh, in the agricultural food context how innovation entrepreneurship ecosystem may actually be uh, both conceptualized and then implemented. There are things that are regu like regulations, of course, but there are all, also multi-stakeholder agent uh, configurations, uh, land issues, demographic trends, energy, and, and of course, environmental issues and conditions. Now, I'm switching gears slightly to focus more on the um, industry, on the implementation uh, uh, of these concepts, and then we'll look at quickly at some use cases. So looking at industry 4.0, it's, it's something that is really a major driver in how strategy is formulated and implemented for the digital transformation in all domains. Um, so as we can read here, the fourth industrial revolution is realized by the combination of numerous physical and digital technologies. Uh, AI, cloud computing, adaptive robotics, augmented reality, additive manufacturing, and the Internet of Things. And then the question is, what is it, what are the implications for people and society um, as well as the economy? We have been hearing and reading a lot about the digital divide issues, about the forthcoming uh, major uh, unemployment uh, emerging from this process of the introduction of AI and uh, effectively autonomous systems and uh, modalities pushing out from the equation the human. Uh, you see here the components of Industry 4.0 in more specificity and the, the, the pursuit and the response to these concerns is to look for a more human-centric approach. And so Industry 5.0, which is already a paradigm in Emerging and evolving from Industry 4.0 is focused on in the interaction between humans and machines. And the idea is that we, we, we will pursue and we will try to have improved integration, faster, better automation paired with enabling and empowering further uh, human brains, our, our you know cognition and the role of the human. So this is uh, a more AI centric in that sense and in that in that manner allowing for a more human centric hopefully approach, it can go the other way, of course. Um, and it's the extension and expansion of, of the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0 <clears throat> into the next level. And you see here a historical presentation of the first, second, third, fourth, and now the fifth uh, industrial revolution. In industry 5.0, industrial robots will be a critical component, but it will be, again, operating in a manner that will be uh, much more supportive of humans. They will help close the design loop uh, and will not uh, be the end all and, and be all. Uh, rather, uh, robotic capabilities um, will take a backseat to human intelligence 
compared to what we have in industry 4.0. Uh, and an interesting comparison or draft opposition is looking at the uh, uh, different approaches to um, introducing and developing manufacturing uh, paradigms and standards. Uh, for many decades, in fact, companies tried to uh, deal with their biggest, what they perceive to be their biggest expenditure factor or cost driver, meaning the human, by introducing more and more robots. Uh, what they have come to realize in many cases is that uh, beyond a certain point, it actually becomes increasingly self-defeating and uh, even dangerous. And uh, there is more of an approach to what we, we call, and in fact, we have an ongoing project on industrial innovation excellence. And what we look at, the next generation lean manufacturing, uh, combining craft and lean with intelligent manufacturing. This is really an, in, an example of an implementation of Industry 5.0. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, more, uh, some more detail on this paradigm, and there have been studies, as you can read in this slide, um, of what industry leaders expect and think about um, uh, Industry 5.0. It's about bringing the human touch back to manufacturing uh, and uh, uh, moving beyond uh, just, uh, again, machine-centric smart factories to more human-centric uh, uh, intelligent environments. Um, so we're trying to make a contrast between smartness and intelligence in this regard. Um, and this harmony of cognitive thinking and mechanical output we read at the bottom of this slide is not as far in the future as you might think. And based on a survey by Accenture of more than 500 manufacturing executives from the North America, Europe, and Asia, 85% of them expect human-machine collaborative environments to be commonplace by 2020. That's next year. I don't know how uh, realistic or you know aggressive to promote or advance their own business development, perhaps, this finding is. But there's certainly uh, some residual truth in it. I make uh, an analogy here from uh, a movie and a book that I enjoyed reading almost more than 30 years ago now. Um, it's called Firefox. And this is actually, um, you see the link on the slide. This is about um, a, a book and a movie that actually made, was made by uh, Clean this hood um, and uh, Western allies. There was, this is like late 70s, early 80s. The Soviets have developed uh, a very advanced um, next generation plane where avionics are really enabled by artificial intelligence. There is a, a, an electromagnetic link between the pilot's brain and the plane's avionics, and they try to steal it because they can reproduce it. And uh, of course, this is an interesting uh, example, I guess, of what could become uh, an Industry 5.0 uh, implementation, uh, whether it's civilian or other sectors. Right? Um, and of course, what is underlined here is addressing the digital divide and unemployment concerns and issues. If your job can be reduced as a point A to point B operation, your skills will be replaced by robots and computers or autonomous vehicles for that matter. And so, of course, that means that where the human uh, has an impl important role, uh, whether it's medicine, transportation, agriculture, or other sectors, um, the role of the human will be expanded and extended, enabled by technology, but then also transformed. And the tradition, main traditional job will have to be reinvented. Um, and so, um, let me see here, because I, again, I'm trying to work with the slides. Um, this is uh, a comment about imagination, because the idea is that as we develop all of these things, uh, and innovation, of course, is important, but thinking not just outside the box, but what, li what I like to identify as thinking beyond the box, truly creative, uh, you know, uh, beyond, liberated from the existing established norms and uh, assumptions, thinking will be increasingly critical. Um, so, the way we can operationalize artificial intelligence, 
uh, encompasses knowledge acquisition, but also learning competencies, what I mentioned earlier, that enables and empowers through big data analytics, organizational resilience, and intelligence. And uh, in that sense, it's also into sustainable entrepreneurship and sustainable uh, operations or competitiveness overall, which we call robust competitiveness. Uh, I'll go quickly through these slides. I'll just let you look at them. Some statistics about why, why AI matters and it's important for today's businesses. Uh, there is first, second, and higher order, uh, third order and higher or beyond that order impacts or effects that AI will, has and will have. Um, it's foundational technology. It, 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 it completes and enhances our cognition substantially. And uh, it can really uh, serve as the bridge between this industry 4.0 and 5.0. There is general intelligence, narrow intelligence, and super intelligence. This is really more related to uh, whether we're looking at and discussing uh, specific applications where AI is focusing on whether and to the extent which data analytics, in fact, uh, not just data, but information and knowledge analytics um, are supporting it. Uh, and then, of course, whether it is a competence that is general uh, capability and applicability, or is it uh, more application specific, which has been the traditional historical context of AI applications development. Uh, so, scanning the environment, learning ability, grasping and interpreting, reasoning and problem solving are key characteristics. And there are, of course, differences between machine and human intelligence, and they relate to this man, human centric versus uh, machine centric approaches in terms of sensing data, environmental scanning, memory, creativity, and emotions. Uh, whether again, we we'll go back to Star Trek and Mr. Data. The human knowledge with the capacity almost to have uh, human sensitivities and the capacity to have empathy and so forth. Um, that is still, thankfully, I would say at this point, out in the future, but it is not beyond the uh, landscapes that are being probed uh, right now by researchers. Uh, three types of learning are the major types of learning uh, that are intrinsic in artificial intelligence, supervised and supervised and reinforcement learning. They support the three types of artificial intelligence we discussed earlier, and they can now be seen in this map, so to speak, at the core of which is deep learning and then AI uh, neural nets or ANN machine learning and artificial intelligence at large are the broader context. So at the very heart of, of AI is deep learning, the capacity, again, to have uh, learning not just in a responsive and reactive manner, but also in a rather proactive, predictive, possibly even preemptive and preventive manner. Uh, what happened, why is it happening, and why, what should or will happen? Uh, these are the key questions that are uh, addressed with AI applications. Uh, these, these are fundamental to operating a business uh, from the very beginning, uh, I guess, of time, but now it's becoming, um, again, more of a human-centric and machine-centric uh, com combination. Uh, optimization and forecasting uh, applications are really part of this, uh, as you can see here. And then I'm going to go into use cases uh, and try to address and discuss uh, related uh, contexts in the quintuple helix uh, framework always. So government, university, industry, civil society, and the environment. Uh, looking at the, you know, from the government side, the sustainable goals, the 17 sustainable development goals are, of course, uh, a very useful and pertinent categorization. There are many schools of thought as to whether there should be fewer, different, or more. Uh, one of them, for example, relates to our questions or our discussion today in terms of scarcity versus abundance. Goal number two, zero hunger. Um, and if you back to this, uh, the objective is to abolish hunger. And uh, you can do that, obviously, by increasing food production. But of course, part of this is also uh, managing demographics better. And then, of course, uh, minimizing, if not abolishing, waste. There's tremendous 
hundreds of billions, if not more, uh, of dollars or some currency uh, of food wasted um, in annually. And this is something that can make a big difference. In developed uh, societies, this is much more, more of an issue. Then next you see in more detail uh, examples what it means, uh, uh, ending hunger, achieving food security and improved nutrition obviously has impact on health. Uh, regarding, for instance, this children in India, um, women, um, infant and young children that will not get minimum dietary diversity, okay? And then all these other things that we can see here. Um, so, uh, for example, if the food prices change and if they double at the bottom right, you see an example of a what-if scenario a case India could lose up to four nine billion in GDP, and it could have not, it's not just the money; is who would be mostly impacted, the most vulnerable, of course. Um, you see the urban effects in terms of pollution, transportation, urbanization. India, but also China, of course, is is a very interesting cases in point. Um, development has becoming impacted, is being impeded by pollution. Many people that because of their skill sets are, starting with the Chinese, of course, are able to move around the world, avoid living in Beijing, for example, because of the persistent uh, dangerous pollution levels at this point. And the same, unfortunate place uh, to some parts of India and other parts of the world, of course. Electricity, water, infrastructure are also pertinent uh, factors in this. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, a helpline was developed to promote uh, sustainable and, of course, um, how should I say, more more legitimate type of agriculture, not development of poppies. Uh, it was not very successful, and this is an underlying message here that we should be very much sensitive to people, culture, and technology issues and dynamics. We should be aware that you know, people are not uh, the people who are trying to help are not really uh, necessarily uh, the most uh, informed, educated, and uh, advanced potential users of the technology. So better designs and more humility would be appropriate in this regard. And this is inherent, in, in my mind, in the human-centric uh, approach. Uh, and of course, you see here what's happened over the years in terms of the opium production, <clears throat> which you see in the picture here. From the industry point of view, um, a concept uh, showing in more detail how competition, cost specialization, and co-evolution uh, take place, and uh, looking at inputs, whether from uh, Adam Smith, uh, uh, Peter, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, or Peter Drucker, uh, land, labor, capital, technology, and entrepreneurship, or knowledge, how they are effectively transformed into results, which is firms, profitability, growth, and so forth, through these uh, dynamics of competition, evolution, and cost specialization. Um, this um, may be useful in looking at how technology companies, and we see a, a snapshot of that in the agricultural domain, um, introduce solutions like, for instance, precision agriculture and predictive analytics. Um, for management software, robotics, drones, uh, smart irrigation, and next generation farms to both uh, reduce pollution and wastage and enhance uh, efficacy, effective and efficient uh, production. At the same time, uh, things like the precautionary principle that relates to GMOs. Uh, and the use or not of those and, and how you deal with this is another example of technology uh, challenges, not just opportunities. Um, this is a case where, as I said before, we need to be careful uh, to not just think of the farmer as a confused farmer and that we only need to uh, introduce a smarter solution, a smartphone perhaps, or modality to support their their activities. We may also need to uh, better understand what the farmer really wants and needs and what the real challenges are rather than simply uh, pushing technology on them. And this 
this is important in all such uh, visual visualizations and, and uh, concepts being developed and promoted. Uh, you see here, this is a digital agriculture uh, conceptualization promoted by a consultancy, Accenture, right? So then you need to be, uh, of course, uh, open-minded, but uh, of course, mindful at the same time as to what other issues may not be properly focused on. Again, the people, culture, and technology challenges and opportunities. Uh, a related slide here in terms of agriculture and you know, promoting uh, ICT, information communication technologies enabled agriculture. You see the different categories or different types of ICT applications, sensor networks, mobile, telephony, satellite, and all that, and where that can make a difference in the farmer's life. What we need to also be aware and cognizant of is that there are uh, many intermediaries and many other interests, organized interests that, uh, again, operate on the scarcity versus abundance uh, modulation and regulation frontier, and they don't necessarily limited abundance. Uh, at the same time, from, you know, No longer you will be currency because of unlimited uh, supply of everything. So this is an interesting paradigm that goes beyond the current understanding we have of uh, different properties and uh, they're all of institutions. Uh, that matter, uh, cryptocurrencies interesting again type of technology and blockchain of the blockchain paradigm that may. Uh, uh, provide interabilities, but challenges in this regard. Um, this is just to show this uh, kind of, uh, public private research collaboration models, including uh, federal research institutes, universities, private companies, and how they form uh, creators, cooperative research and development agreements to produce and share knowledge. This is Looking at the mode three and knowledge production system and the different systems or systems it encompasses the political system, an innovation system, education, academic, economic, and then R and D system uh, as well. And this these are they're all connected. Um, this shows um institutions this is an our uh, discussion about uh, agriculture, so the agriculture system, and then agricultural innovation and for nurse ecosystem, if you wish. Um, there's policies and investments and so forth. Uh, we looked at this. Uh, we discussed or touched on this earlier in terms of the linear innovation modes versus the nonlinear innovation mode, and this is the mode three, uh, highly uh, nonlinear, uh, allowing for higher order learning, and the transformation, uh, you know, thinking beyond the box, as I said earlier, and the transformation, not just uh, of the way of learning and innovating, but also of institutions involved in this. So we have um, a new, uh, new paradigms of universities, for instance, emerging, for more uh, vertical, uh, configure, vertically configured and discipline-centric to more research-centered based and uh, important thematic areas uh, that, are, that tend to be cross or even transdisciplinary uh, centric. So they're centered around, uh, for instance, uh, next generation agriculture uh, or technologies, but also um, modalities and, and, and solutions, not just uh, disciplines. And this is this is an important uh, change in the context of universities. In civil, in, ter in terms of civil society, um, we have uh, a, a, an understanding, uh, and we show here how the different modes of knowledge production system and the different services are connected and complementing and reinforcing each other. And how now we have supply and demand, um, uh, balancing and convergence um, 
issues in the context of geopolitical relationships, political governance, uh, food, civil security, and, and so forth. You have uh, issues that relate to both, again, scarcity as well as abundance, challenges and opportunities, and drivers of, of the conditions and, and the trends that may relate to environmental, demographic or economic factors. Um, and you see, you saw here this multi-stakeholder configuration. Um, the vision and mission, again, a world in which all producers enjoy secure, sustainable livelihoods and fulfill their potential and decide their future. Con the mission will be connecting disadvantaged producers and consumers to promote fairer trading conditions, conditions and empower producers to combat poverty, strengthen their position and take more control over their lives. Um, so this is from the transformation, if you wish, over the agricultural a paradigm from a civil society point of view. And uh, fair trade uh, uh, pro pro producing uh, countries uh, showing in color-coded uh, manner here. Um, and then here we look at uh, different parts of the world and how uh, farming uh, in, in terms of uh, ICT enabled supported farming uh, fair trade farmers, workers and fair trade certified plantations and so forth can can be um, found around the world. What is the configuration and distribution of those? Um, so for instance, in Latin America, you see uh, that fair trade is 21% of all farmers, production 10% and 20% of total. Uh, and that compares Interestingly, to Africa and the Middle East, where the numbers are much larger, um, and the smallest numbers are in the Asia and the Pacific. So it's interesting how things are not necessarily as one might expect in this regard. And that's both a challenge and an opportunity. We're revisiting uh, in terms of the environment, uh, the system that we looked at earlier in terms of the quintuple innovation helix framework and what it means in terms of climate smart agriculture, which is a concept that in a way reflects the quintuple innovation helix uh, approach. National food security and development goals in a, in a climate smart sense where sustainability uh, is implemented in a way uh, through uh, both producing productivity and income, uh, enhancing resilience to climate change and viability and reducing at the same time the impact of agriculture to climate change, for instance, meth methane production in uh, meat-centric agriculture. 45% uh, cut in carbon emissions by 2030, so this is now the Green New Deal, could keep global warming to a sustainable level. Um, and there are some thoughts as to what to do in this regard, of course. Um, uh, this is something that is open, I think, to very uh, um, reasonable uh, types of criticism beyond the politics um, and issues we need to find, uh, again, the most uh, appropriate solutions and approaches in this regard. In terms of the opinion, uh, public opinion survey on the Green New Deal, um, and this is now looking at this from a political point of view, uh, as well as a broader point of view. You see that the support rate is not very high, broadly speaking, and it's just compared to uh, the border wall issue with Mexico uh, to show you how people react to both of these. Uh, Democrats, the Democratic Party voters in the U.S. are those who support this, of course, more than anybody else. Uh, the question is, again, uh, sustainability as well as the communication cooperation coordination issue that I raised earlier. It's for formula formulating, framing um, a solution that you propose that is really realistic and feasible. Uh, there is a very admir admirable uh, and inspiring even young lady from Sweden who's proposing, uh, this is an environmental activist, proposing that we stop flying at all. Um, and, of course, this is an interesting concept in, ter in terms of reducing uh, ozone-destroying uh, pollution in, in high atmosphere, but at the same time, 
not very realistic for most of us. So we need to figure out things that can be worked out. Um, I mentioned Industry 6.0. So if we were to push Industry 5.0 beyond the, the current emergence phase and see what's next. Uh, and in a rather practical manner, I show here insights for policy and practice uh, regarding smart tariffs, taxation, uh, post world trade organization world where big data and semantic analytics can, can focus uh, implementations and solutions. In terms of the smart tariffs and taxation, there's an interesting case with the Swiss were and their 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 time variable uh, tariffs substantially variable, uh, many orders of magnitude on things like uh, strawberries to protect their own domestic strawberry production. Uh, smarter targeted open innovation uh, approaches, research and innovation, smarter specialization strategies, smarter metrics, the next generation of um, community innovation surveys modalities, uh, and then, of course, looking at the ecosystem as Helix, and from smart planet to smart cities. All of these are themes we have some type of uh, research activity going on right now, and we're trying to develop, uh, hopefully, useful insights. There's also already publications I'll be happy to share upon, upon request. So in, in closing, points to remember, uh, innovation is a culture, not a department. Uh, and uh, quoting uh, Plato, until philosophers are kings or the kings and princes of the world have the spirit and power of, of philosophy, we will have always serious problems. This is perhaps anticipating uh, things like nowadays the challenge of populism we're dealing with and the coming up elections this Sunday in the European um, context. The highest form of thinking is the comprehensive intuition of the man who sees all things as part of a system. And thank you, I guess, in Chinese, Shashe. So thank you for your time. I'm sorry if I run over. Um, am, I, uh, am I online? Yes, I can hear you. OK, perfect. Thank you very, very much, Elias, for having distillated uh, a lifetime of knowledge uh, in uh, such a, an effective way. Um, and I like your, uh, your closing uh, philosophical commentary. Uh, a couple of questions to start the discussion. Uh, your work is very much anchored into systems of systems, complexity, uh, science approach, if I am correct. Um, and I would like to see if you can, can give us uh, a bit more detail on the underlying, whether it's computational or empirical um, uh, uh, approach that underlie uh, your work at this, the, in this, uh, those innovation systems. Hello? Hello? Am I on? Yes, yes, you are. Um, not sure what happened. I think that uh, Dr. Karyanis lost his internet connection. Let's see if he comes back. The connection were really bad. Is it, on which side uh, is the uh, is the problem, Sabina? I cannot tell. It might be. Yes, hello. I can hear you now. Okay, that's good. Okay. Well, I, I missed the whole question, though, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, so I was, one, thanking you for uh, such a nice integrative talk. Um, and I was um, uh, saying that if I am correct in looking at uh, a good number of your paper, uh, your approach is really uh, uh, taking the systems of systems approach in complexity and computational science. Um, and some of your paper, for instance, on uh, um, multi-goal optimization or multi criteria decision making. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could uh, educate us a bit in terms of the underlying uh, computational and analytical approach in the bulk of the work that you you are doing or have been doing. Sure. Um, so basically, um, <clears throat> we uh, take uh, uh, 
we we adopt multiple approaches and and you know sort of mixed methods uh, because of the both of the complexity of the issues we're trying to address, and then also the biggest challenge is the um, <clears throat> either the scarcity or the um, um, uh, fragmentation of data and data sets. So what we do is we work with both qualitative and quantitative methods. We operate at uh, multiple levels, macro, meso, and micro. We therefore we may do case studies, we may do interviews and surveys. We also work with time series data, and we also work with simulation uh, and intelligent agents uh, approaches where we try to discover what exists uh, as it can be uh, uh, captured and described by the data that we can access. And then also we try to see what could or should be and what could become. And this is going back to the being from being to becoming issue uh, with the uh, simulation and uh, optimization methods that we uh, deploy uh, to enhance our uh, effectiveness and efficiency that is inherent in the ecosystems design we propose. So I hope I somewhat addressed that question. So your unit of uh, observation is really the ecosystem as a whole uh, and trying to unravel the various uh, level and the various actors within each level, not necessarily observing country level innovation system. Am I correct? Well, uh, yes, uh, but even even more specifically, we are looking at uh, uh, stakeholders uh, in the form of, for instance, entities that may be public, you know, looking across the spectrum of the quadruple helix, entities that may be companies, may be governmental uh, institutions or agencies, may be uh, NGOs and civil society. So. We're looking at ecosystems as, as I said in the presentation, multi-modal, multi-nodal, mm -hmm. many, many nodes, many stakeholder units, mm -hmm. uh, combinations that operate in different ways. They have multiple connections and they all form effectively uh, a rather dynamic and complex uh, configuration, which is the ecosystem. Yes. Okay, um, uh, I have uh, always more questions, but let's see if there is some question coming from the floor. You mm. just unmute yourself and you identify and ask your question. And also, if you could briefly provide some background, I mean, who who you are and where you're, uh, you know, what's your professional context? Is there a question from the ground, from the the the, the cyber floor, I should say? Uh, this is uh, Sandra. I'm uh, Sandra Schillow. I'm a um, professor at the University of Ottawa. Um, I do innovation entrepreneurship research. Thank you for yes. connecting me to Lorette, Sandra, first of all. Yes. Your well, well, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I, if I you can speak a bit louder, Sandra, that would be useful. Uh, oh, even louder? Okay, I feel like I'm yelling already. Is this better? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so very fascinating talk, and I, I much appreciate your your work overall. Um, anyways, there's like so much to dig into. Um, if I may, just perhaps um, take one little piece of this. Um, so the um, which which would be the role of universities. Um, they're kind of central to the triple helix arrangement. Um, Obviously, they're um, much less central because there's so many other very important players in the quadruple and quintuple helix. Um, but I'm kind of wondering uh, where you see uh, universities playing in the, um, in you know, whether it's industry 5.0 or then even heading into 6.0. And part of the reason why I'm asking this is that. Um, I think uh, you're very much onto some very important trends, but I'm not really necessarily seeing them reflected in much of academic research. Obviously, on the technological side, there's work being done, but in terms of how universities functions and uh, function and contribute to the ecosystem, um, are we seeing enough adaptation and and maybe even leadership? I, I got it. I got it. Thank you. And this is a great question. In fact, this is again going back to the. Uh, from being to becoming issue, all of the uh, institutions, as I mentioned in the presentation, along with their ways of interacting, 
are, are conceptualized as being both complex and dynamic that is evolving and mutating, transforming. That includes the universities. Uh, and I'm saying this in the sense uh, or, or in, in terms of referring as to what they should be doing more than what they are doing. And I did mention that the emerging paradigm is one of um, not discipline-centric uh, verticals or portals of universities, schools, and departments, but rather um, discipline-centric. Uh, if you want to mute your, if you could mute your microphone, it would help. It would help, I think. Uh, rather, discipline, rather thematic area-centric you know, uh, thinking of universities in a self-similar sense, in a fractal sense, where they consist of self-similar uh, units that may be research centers that transcend their transdisciplinary, and they're not necessarily part of a specific school or department only, but they're really, uh, you know, cross-cutting. And <clears throat> to the extent that, and you do have some universities, you know, top of the line, uh, universities have become really um, much more uh, aligned with this configuration, um, uh, basically like MIT and so forth. Uh, they really are much more a combination of, of research and development centers. And in fact, the role of the universities overall, actually, I consider it to be much more uh, significant and central in the uh, uh, quadruple and, and quintuple helix context than the triple. Why? Because the triple helix concept, and this is always has been my concern and motivation for introducing uh, the new complementary concepts is that the triple helix, in a way, ennobles, uh, validates, recognizes top down authority and power. Uh, and so, in the triple helix sense, frankly, uh, whether we like it or not, the main, uh, you know, the main node, so to speak, is the government, uh, with complementary substituting uh, to some extent, but certainly complementary roles uh, or nodes being the university in the industry. Uh, I think that the university is much more uh, central and substantial in its role and its um, configuration in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, quadruple helix because the university is where new knowledge but also communication, cooptation and coordination needs to come from impacting and enabling civil society as well as government and industry to operate in a manner that is more uh, human-centric and then, of course, also more sustainable. So that's the environmental uh, consideration. So I don't I hope I addressed part of the question at least. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. I think um, uh, uh, Elias was having a hard stop at 12.15. Uh, so uh, I am willing to take a few more minutes if there are people. I don't want to simply leave people with questions unanswered. If, I, if there are questions, Please. Is, are there other questions from the from the virtual floor? Well, I would love a follow-up question on that one. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, so much appreciate your point um, about the roles they kind of should be playing. How do you see um, resources and capabilities? play into this um, because my sense is that um, um, people don't quite have the capabilities to, to even just perceive the quintuple helix, let alone act on it. I think some companies probably are developing these skills because it's a matter of survival and, and, and they actually put the resources and they make the resources available for them uh, behind it. But I'm not sure that governments and, and universities uh, um, um, well, aren't quite there yet. Uh, again, another great question, uh, if I may. Uh, the, again, this is why we believe, um, again, the potential for impacting and driving uh, transformative and, and meaningful change right, lies with the universities as long as they would, uh, you know, live up to their and, and act up to their uh, leadership responsibilities and potential. So that's remaining a challenge. But of course, the universities really, as I like to remind our administrators, are not 
uh, the different, uh, the, the various formal uh, structures and infrastructures, institutions, or administrators. The universities, the, the heart, soul, and blood of the university is the professors and then the students. Uh, the people involved as the key stakeholders in the exchange of ideas and the formation of new knowledge. So in that sense, the industry 5.0 and then 6.0 beyond that paradigms we introduced because we believe are very important uh, tools as part of this communication, cooptation, and coordination process to help people, whether in government, in industry, or elsewhere, to conceptualize, or civil society for that matter, to conceptualize uh, how to best go about developing effective and efficient solutions. In a sense, that really relates to and impacts the resilience and sustainability, not only of the environment, but also of, of democratic democracy as a regime. Because inherent in our promotion of the quadruple and the quintuple innovation helix frameworks is a conscious choice that democracy and not autocracy is, in fact, a truly sustainable way of being and becoming, of existing. And, uh, you know, that certainly underlying this comment about democratic capitalism that I made earlier, and in my mind at least, it's one way to uh, help bring about a, a transformation not only in terms of institutions, technologies, and, and modalities in general, but also in terms of mindsets and, and ways of thinking. And I think there is progress, and I think there is room and reason for optimism, uh, cautious optimism in this regard. Uh, along with all the challenges we're confronted with, we may well be uh, at the cusp of uh, meaningful and uh, positive change. So, we'll see. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I would uh, like to uh, end the webinar here. Uh, thank you very much, the participant. Thank you, Elias, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we will have uh, one last uh, CI webinar as part of this year's series. Um, uh, late June, the date yet to be confirmed, and it will be Gian Vito Lanzola uh, from the, uh, the business school in the City University in London on the digital transformation of open innovation this time. Uh, zooming on uh, banking and insurance services, uh, very complementary to what uh, other presentation we have been having uh, over uh, this uh, season. May I, may I add something at the end? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. This is a great initiative. Uh, I, as I have been uh, reviewing and I'm becoming more familiar with what you've been doing, this is a very important um, uh, effort and initiative, and it's one way to actually operationalize what we've been discussing. Yeah. Uh, it's about communication, cooptation, and coordination. It's about the democracy of knowledge, and hopefully you'll do more and more of those, and I'm happy to remain an active stakeholder. And again, thank you to Sandra and to you, of course, Lorette. Thank you to you and to everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Thank you, Elias. Bye.